stories of Briscoe and Bradshaw. I would be Bradshaw. That would be your Chickasha native and your Chickasha Hall of Famer, Oklahoma's favorite son, Mr. Gerald Briscoe. And we got the former multi-time Texas heavyweight champion, Puerto Rico heavyweight champion, NWA Florida champion, you name it. Also the man, that, according to James Beard, brought Texas back from the dead. He is Mr. Eric Embry. Eric, welcome to the show. Hey, thank you. Happy to be here. I, I just hope I can feel these shoes being on this show with two guys like you. I hope I can do okay. It, it's well, an you, you, you know, Eric, and you, we go way, 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 way back. And we got some stories on each other we can share on that show there that, that are kind of, kind of even unbelievable, even, even for a professional wrestling standard. But you, <laughs> yeah. you, you, you helped me carry out one of the greatest ribs ever on Mike Graham. And I don't think he ever <laughs> forget, forgave either one of us for it. So, but we'll get into that a little bit later. But, you know, just like, like we start out a lot of time, a lot of, lot of, lot of new fans out there, you know, who is Eric Emery? What, what, what's his background? Ty Cotton, I know you're an old Kentucky boy and proud of it, man. Just like uh, John, proud to be a Texan for some reason. I'm proud to be an Oki for obvious reasons. So, uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> so anyway, Eric, you know, growing up in Kentucky there, uh, you're, you're in that part of the United States where you probably got several choices of wrestling in there. Tell us, tell us who, who was your preference and who did you like and who kind of inspired you beside me to, make, to become a professional wrestler? You see what I got to deal with, Eric? I, I do this all the time. He hired me in 95, and I've been having to deal with it ever since. Woo, boy, oh, boy, oh, boy. Well, back, back, you know, we're talking uh, 40 years ago about, I guess, maybe longer. Oh, yeah, longer, 40, 64. We're 45, 48 years ago when I started. But uh, the uh, only wrestling we had in Kentucky back then was the uh, NWA Nick Goulas out of Nashville. Uh, Jerry Jarrett hadn't split off yet. So uh, some of the wrestlers uh, back then would have been Tojo Yamamoto, uh, Lynn Rossi, Bearcat Brown, uh, Don and Al Green, the Von Brauners, Saul Weingroff, and the list goes on. Uh, how did I get into it is uh, a day and a half story. So I cut it real short. Uh, I can't remember wanting to ever be anything else growing up i always when i when i was little uh took a lot of flack through high school hey, you're gonna be a wrestler what was yeah. it was it your grandmother that kind of put her put you on her knee and said watch this kid yes yeah my grandmother uh i stayed with her some my dad was a riverboat captain and uh, was gone for a month at a time my mother had a beauty shop and i stayed with my mom a whole lot and uh, when wrestling come on on Saturday afternoon, if that lady's house was on fire, you didn't bother her until after wrestling went off. So that's how I got started watching it and so forth. And uh, went, went to uh, some, I guess we called them after I knew the terminology, an outlaw show in uh, Owensboro at the Armory. And uh, $850 later, and... Uh, Worked out with me one time that I can remember. Taught me a headlock and an arm bar. Who, who was this? Who was this? Who? That, that, that was uh, uh, Don Pruitt was the old promoter. He's dead now. And uh, the wrestler was uh, Ron Edward Strevel from West Virginia. And uh, anyway, uh, my dad had some political pull. And... Uh, the governor called the wrestling commissioner and they pulled Don Pruitt's, Pruitt's promoting license. And uh, the guy that uh, took the, I paid the money to, and I'm sure he gave a cut to Pruitt, <clears throat> gave me his wrestling ring and trailer to call it even with him. <laughs> gave me a ring. So you had a ring before you knew how to wrestle him. Yes, yes. And uh, so I, uh, some way I got in touch or got in touch with me uh, Mike Porter out of Tennessee, and uh, he come and bought my ring for the eight hundred and fifty dollars, which I had no clue what, you know, I just gave away, and uh, he wrote me a cold check. <laughs> <laughs> so Goulas was having matches in Monticello, uh, Kentucky, and I saw that he was going to be there. So my dad was in the sheriff's department, the political pool. I probably 17 years old, took the warrant 
the judge issued myself down to the armory, gave it to the policeman. Somebody stooged at the porter and his big fat ass got out of a little bitty armory window and got out of Dodge. <laughs> <laughs> Running for the papers. Huh? Yeah. So he come back. They, they got him up here for court. And he paid me the 850 in court in front of the judge and da da da. And uh, uh, Teeny, Teeny Jarrett, Jerry Jarrett's mother, uh, took a little liking to me. And uh, I called her and thanked her for her help uh, in the process of knowing where he was going to be and so forth. And uh, got booked uh, in a bowling green for Nick Goulas. So that was one of my first matches. So, and, so uh, wait a minute. So you actually went into the ring and, uh, with one workout under your belt. Yes, yes, wow. knew nothing, <laughs> knew nothing. But he and, owned the uh, ring for a while, Jerry. I had a ring. I've been yeah, playing. Had a ring. Ring. Hey, yeah, you're I a popular guy. Ring. If you got a ring, I mean, back in those days, you were, you were, uh, you were, <laughs> you were in. Yeah, the whole neighborhood was there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, uh, so you know, a headlock and an arm bar, uh, yep. courtesy, of, courtesy of the $850. It was how to reverse the arm bar. That's all I knew, 850 bucks. Anyway, I got my money back, and uh, I don't remember how I hooked up with this little independent outlaw promoter up in eastern Kentucky, Larry Bolin. He was one of the scuffling hillbillies way, way, way back, and... Uh, I made Hazard, Kentucky for him, which is a four or five hour drive from where I lived and uh, still not really smart. I was like, wow, these all guys in the same dressing room. Man, I hope something happened in here. <laughs> but uh, anyway, after the matches, he paid me $5. Wow. And uh, how, many, my, how many miles did you drive around trip for that? Uh, it was at least four hours there, probably four, four and a half, four or four and a half hours there. Even with gas, 30 cents a gallon, I used a whole lot more gas than five dollars. And he booked me for two nights for West Virginia the next night, which is traveling on further. But he told me he'd really take care of me that next night. And uh, he gave me $15. So I'm like, and there was really nice crowds. So my little mind, Kentucky Hillbilly mind, started thinking, you know, the damn promoter is the guy that makes all the money. So... I had one, two, three matches, and I went to Larry Bolin, and I cut a deal to promote my hometown with him. And uh, I, I was a little over, I think I had so long, but it was almost two grand I made off of uh, wrestling in Cloverport that night. So I started promoting towns. Uh, how'd, you, how'd you get the guys booked? Uh, through Larry Bolin. He had the well, ring. He, he I sold the mine. Yeah, yeah, he had the connections. You know, so you well, sold your ring to Larry? That... No, I sold it to Mike Porter in Tennessee. Yeah. But Larry Larry Bolin had the ring. He was already a little outlaw promoter. But I started promoting some towns and making some bucks and still didn't have a clue about, the, you know, the business or even how to work. And uh, it just kind of kind of grew from there. How, how would you uh, promote your matches? I'm curious, curious on being a yeah. promoter myself. How, how, how did you go out and uh, promote your matches? W win the cards, you know, the big ones that we used to use years ago, the big posters. Right. And uh, little, uh, go to the radio station, give them free tickets to give away. That way you get a free spot. And uh, little newspaper ads. That was it. No TV. You know, these guys, people had never heard of anyway. So you just had to let them know wrestling was going to be there. So Eric, did, did you, gave, you, you, gave, you gave the guy $850 and he took your money. You had to, had to call the police to get it back. The second guy wrote you a check that bounced and the promoter jumped out the window and took off running. You had to go back to court <laughs> to get it, to get your rig sold. Did you ever start thinking maybe there's some shysters in this business? <laughs> I learned that right off the bat, didn't I? God, I learned, learned, learned a of business, you know. Uh, and then <clears throat> one of the guys at one of those shows had a a phone number for the wrestling office in Kansas City, and I got that number from him. And uh, I called Kansas City from my grandmother's house, and uh, Buck Robley. I, I had no clue who he was then, but Buck Robley answered the phone. Told him I was looking for a place to come and wrestle, da, da, da. He said, okay, you start here on, and gave me a starting date. Now, were, were, you out of, were you out of high school at this time or what? Yes, yes. I, I'd started wrestling between my, with the outlaws 
between my junior and senior year of high wow. school. And uh, I only went a half a year, my senior year, had enough credits to graduate and uh, then took off to Kansas City. Uh, were you wrestling with someone on your own? Were you wrestling on your own shows? Yes. Oh, yeah. 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 Did, did you put yourself over? Most <laughs> of the time. Most of the time. <laughs> Especially at home. <laughs> well, did, did, did you pay yourself extra is what I want to know. <laughs> <laughs> it was good. But old, old Buck Robley, he, uh, he gave me my first uh, break, so to speak. I was just underneath doing jobs, but what a learning experience. Right. And, uh, who, who, were, uh, who was some of the talent out there were working for Buck at the time? I knew you, I knew you was going to ask me that. <laughs> Gene Stevens, who I never saw after that territory, <laughs> but I worked with him hundreds of times out so there. So you ran him right out of the business, Eric? Huh? You yeah, ran, you ran him right yeah, out of the business. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But uh, Jesse Ventura was out there then, Tank Patton, uh, Bob Brown. Uh, Harley was in and out all the time. He owned a piece of it. And uh, Pat O'Connor, who was a, we never saw eye to eye on anything. <laughs> but uh, I don't remember who, uh, Brody yeah. was coming in and out. And uh, Which was Bro Brody would pay a, a big part of your your uh, your uh, your career later on in life. But uh, where, where did Luthez, I read somewhere where Luthez trained you, and I never knew Lou. Uh, he must have really liked you. You you must have got over at Charlie somehow. I did. And, uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I did. Yeah. It. Uh, I. Uh, promoter in Georgetown, Kentucky, little outlaw promoter. As Lou was getting older, and uh, uh, brought him, Lou in on Sundays, and I'd work. I'd go work that show on Sundays for him. And uh, I can remember pulling up behind the building, and a lady sitting in this little blue car. And uh, as I'm going in, I tapped on the window. She wrote it down, and I said, uh, do, you, "Do you need help getting in or anything? Or you know what's going?" On? She said, "Oh no, no." She goes, uh, "I'm Miss Thez. I'm I'm Charlie. I'm Lou's Thez's wife." Wow. I said, "Oh, okay." And I said, "So you're taking care of your okay?" She goes, "Oh yes." That started it, and her and I just got along great. And grumpy old Lou uh, had no uh, choice yeah. but to take me under his wing and like me. Was that the first training you got? Because you had the the one eight hundred fifty bucks, and you hopped right in the ring. Were you, were you ever trained during this time, or was it all in the ring? No, it's all in the ring. Wow, uh, I'd met a couple, couple of the outlaw boys uh, were my my age. Uh, da Danny Fargo, Dan Greer, I, I tagged with years later, and I brought him to San Antonio. But uh, him and I buddied up, and uh, you know we'd work out in the dressing room, teach each other what we had been seeing people do on TV and how to do it. Now, psychology was completely out the damn window. We had no clue about psychology, kind of like it is today in my mind. But, <laughs> other than that, uh, but Kansas City was a real training ground because the guys there could work. Right. Kansas City was known for that. I mean, yeah, I had all fortunate enough when I was real, real young in the business to go up there a couple of time for their TVs and being able to work with guys that you mentioned like Bob Bulldog, Bob Brown and Pat O'Connor. Pat taught me a lot, a lot of, a lot in the business and, uh, and, uh, and guys like that and, uh, and Geigle and the race. And so you, you're in, you're in an ideal place for a young guy to, to start out. And Tom, Tom Andrews was over big there. Oh, Tom, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And he, he'd been one of the interns in Nashville that I grew up with watching so that was I was like in awe around time <laughs> but you know I, I taught myself and Lou told me but to listen to the old timers and not just listen to what they tell you go out there and execute do what they told you where they can see that you're listening to them you're just not bullcrapping them and that you want to learn and that that psychology worked for me tremendously everywhere I went and, and I really appreciated the guys uh so that, that, that was probably Lou's best advice to you and, and that, that's where a lot of guys our, our age missed out on uh, years ago was taking these old timers seriously and sitting in that car and listening to them 
And you just hit it on the nail. Not only listen to them, but the next night when you're in the ring, after they remember telling you something, the next night you go out and you do one of those, one of those uh, psychology bits that, that they were talking about in the car. And that yes. puts you over that, that, that. You're right. That makes those old timers really, really gravitate to you. And, and the word gets around. Hey, this kid will listen. Just, just give him an opportunity. Yes. Yes. And that, that's, uh, I don't guess there was ever a big break, but that worked for me everywhere. And I was sincere. I wasn't, in my mind, I'm not using these old timers. I really want you to help me. You know, I want to be like you one day. Help me, please. And uh, most of them did. Most of them did. A lot of people don't realize you know, it's, it's hard to get over. And if these, if, if a guy's gotten over anywhere, he has some knowledge. And he has knowledge yeah. to share because it's not the easiest thing in the world to get over. Anybody right. can go out there and do all the moves. You know, you see that all the time. You've seen it throughout our history of wrestling, but to get over is tough. And, and if somebody's gotten over, they have something to share. Right. And if you ask them uh, and they tell you, <clears throat> they're going to watch you to see if you're just uh, bullshitting right. them or you really want to learn. And if you go out and do what they told you you needed to try to do, then uh, they're, they're never going to stop giving you information, which is exactly what you want. And I don't think the, the business today understands that at all. I don't, I don't know. I don't know if it's they don't understand, Eric, or they just don't have the opportunity that we had. We had we had a unique opportunity back in our days because there was you traveled, you traveled by car, you traveled by bus or whatever. Mm -hmm. And then yeah. you, you were kind of forced to be with a group of guys, you know, because you didn't want to be out there alone. Travel. A lot of guys did. But, but but when you're starting out young, you, you want to be around a group of guys. So you, you just learn the road. And I think the opportunity is not there for a lot of these young men and women today. No, uh, not that they, don't, that, that they don't want to. I just don't think they had the same same opportunities that we had. That, that, that makes sense. I understand that that way. That, yeah, you're probably right there. <laughs> what did you butt heads with Pat O'Connor about? You know, <clears throat> I don't really know. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I can remember being at Kansas City TV <clears throat> and uh, Pat O'Connor booked uh, St. Louis. Right. St. Louis was the biggest payday of the territory. And uh, him and Geigel are, are over by the curtain arguing. And I hear my name. And so I ease over. And O'Connor's telling Pat, he's a good kid. But Pat Bullcrap, he's a good boy, Pat. He's a good kid. Pat said, I don't care. I am never using him there. He'll never go to St. Louis. And, and they were having an argument about me. And that's all it took for me to overhear that and know where my <laughs> friends were. <laughs> you know who they are. <laughs> Did he ever but use you in St. Louis? Louis? No. No. <laughs> never. never. Did you and, ever find uh, out what it was he didn't like? Nope. It, uh, I seen him. He, they brought him in to Tampa one time when I was there. Uh, I don't know what he was traveling with the champion or a referee or something, but I remember I'm thinking, Oh my God, he's going to be here. And, you know, I'm trying to get over here. I'm doing good. First really good break. And, uh, and the armory had that balcony at the back of the armory for the dressing rooms up over everybody. And he's standing up there and I'm like, well, you know, everybody's kissing butt to him. And I'm like, well, you know, I got to at least be friendly. So I walked up to him. I said, hey, Mr. O'Connor, how you been, buddy? He said, oh, okay. okay. And I said, Pat, did I ever do anything to you to make you not like me? And he couldn't remember. He said, no, well, where'd I know you from? I said, Kansas City. He said, no, no, not that I remember. So I just let it die. You know, I was afraid I'm going to make Andy or one of the Briscoes mad because, you know, O'Connor's in that clique, and I didn't want to stir, stir up nothing. Thank you. I was in a clique with someone. Wow. <laughs> you were part of the original clique, Jerry. <laughs> yes. So, yes. Uh, so Eric, uh, you were in Kansas City. Uh, uh, how long did that did that run up there last? Would you, would you, would you, and, and the great thing about it, you were meeting guys in Kansas City was kind of like one of those meeting points where a lot of good talent would go to, to go out to the other parts of the country because it was so centrally located there. So uh, you were meeting a lot of talent. Where, where you, you, I guess you were making friends and, and, and kind of getting 
because well, you're brand new to the business and, and, I, and even the, 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 I had a brother that was in the business a couple of years before I got in. I mean, he, we didn't know where to go. We didn't, you know, we'd listen to the talent. Well, you want to go this territory because they three guys really good or you don't want to go this territory because you'll starve to that. But what, who, 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 who did you power up with there to kind of learn a little bit more about the road life? And the oh, Je Jesse, Jesse Ventura. I rode oh. with Jesse a lot and, uh, I'm sorry. Jesse, yeah, God love him. Yeah, you know, know, to me, the, the impression he made on me back then is that man could could take a light bulb apart and put it back together and it would work. But common sense to me, <laughs> we may be lacking a little bit there. <laughs> you know, he, I shouldn't say that, but it's the way I feel. I mean, you know, and uh, I think it was Jesse that. Uh, turned me on to Portland because I think I went from Kansas City to Portland for Don and Elton went out there for a while and gosh then it was Vancouver and Calgary Calgary who were, who were, who were, yeah, Portland was loaded with talent and also who were some of the great stars was that a Piper run out there that at your time you bet boy <laughs> you Lottie, bet. Uh, Buddy Rose uh, Rick Martell uh, Luke Williams, Butch Miller, sheep herders or bushwhackers. Uh, I mean, talent just galore. I, I, I was Elton Owen's little shooter. <laughs> <laughs> he had heard about the Luthez connection. Oh, and, yeah. I, I, well, tell us about that, Luthez. A lot of people and I know uh, we, we tell the story here that we love telling them how Elton would offer five bucks for a guy to go out and take another guy down. Then you guys would go out and work with each other and split the money later on. 25, 25, 25. yeah, 25 uh, to the winner. Most time, nothing to the loser. Or maybe uh, sometimes if he liked the loser, it's going to be 10 to the loser. And yeah, every shoot was worked. <laughs> and Elton would go up to the walk, right up to the ring and kneel down and put his arm up on the apron. Wow. And, oh, he was into it big time, buddy. And uh I mean, everybody, Piper put me over, Rose put me over, Ed Boskowski put me over. I mean, I was a shooting little son of a gun back then. <laughs> and yeah. Did Elton never realize that, that the guys were working? Not not that I ever heard that he did, no. <laughs> he, he, he didn't then. He, he would come back, peel off the money, and give you the winner, and uh, telling you how great, oh, you're so tough. Oh, you're so tough. You know, I think it was a, a, a sexual, whatever the word would be, that Elton had there. No no doubt in my mind. John, John what is that word? Uh, yeah, you're not getting that. <laughs> oh. he, he's my go-to guy for words like that. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, he 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 was saw he was a character boy, and uh, never saw him sober. He, you know, he always just drunk, drunk, drunk at the matches. And uh, but it was a good little territory. And yeah. uh, uh, Don Owens, uh, Dutch Savage was uh, uh, I don't know if I can say prick on here, but uh, you know uh, you know you don't get along with everybody everywhere, right. you know. And uh, by then I was getting a little steam in my head and, uh, you know, I would tell that's what I thought sometimes. Were, were you, you're, you're starting to pick up the business a little bit and, and can tell in your work that you're, you're starting to gain confidence in, in the business. Yes. So. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but it, it uh, awesome territory. Don Owens, I could not say enough good stuff about Don. And Piper, oh my gosh, Roddy took up for the boys. If you thought you got a bad payoff, you didn't go to Don or Elton or somebody, you went to Roddy. Hey, Roddy, how much did you get? I got 60 bucks for this. Really? And boom, Roddy go right to the office, come back, hands you more money. And Roddy, and, Roddy was basically new to the business too during that run, wasn't he? I don't know how new he would know. He did been in California. I think he had that run down okay, there. He he went, the California. Yeah, yeah. He wasn't an old timer, but uh, he knew his way around. He knew, he knew his way around. Yeah, he had, he had pr pr promoters here, in other words, where they didn't want to lose Roddy. They wanted to make Roddy happy. Yeah, 
Yeah, they kept they kept Roddy happy. Well, that, that was just the leader that Piper was. Hot Rod was like that uh, everywhere that he went. I mean, even in his later years, he, he was the guy that would stand up for everybody. And, and that's what I think that's the reason Hot Rod is so respected in, with, with his peers in the business. Yeah, I, I, I never heard anybody has never said a bad word to me about Piper. Right. It, it, uh, so he, so you're, you're well, heading to Oregon. I got something for you, though. <laughs> We're <laughs> right. Now, I, I, I'm just gonna say this now. Roddy, <laughs> say Roddy and me were buddies, and uh, we were buddies. Rode together a little bit, not a whole lot, a little bit. Uh, we're in this. Uh, we're in a high school gym in somewhere in Washington, <clears throat> and uh, Roddy has herpes, and they're broke out. Okay, <laughs> broke out down there, and uh, he. Uh, Went and had his match, come back, comes over where I'm at in the dressing room, starts unlacing his boots, takes his trunks off. And I was like, Roddy, God, what is that? And he's telling me herpes stuff. Okay. I already had this plan. I went over hunting through lockers and everything, and I found this can of fungo. <laughs> fungo spray. I reached down my bag. I said, here, Roddy, I got that crap too. This is the best thing I've ever found for him. And I handed him the can. He just picked his thing up and sprayed all between his legs and over his little things. And the uh, damnedest scream you ever heard. <laughs> into the shower. Oh, my God. He went into the shower, boots, everything, boom, boom. And I got out of the dressing room and got gone. <laughs> <laughs> Next day, he laughed about it with me, but then he would have probably put me up uh, in the shower with him or something. <laughs> <laughs> Go fungo spray. <laughs> now, yeah. you, got? you made that pop back in my mind. <laughs> all, right, all right, Rod, what, 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 what a guy he was to be around. And, and, you know, his knowledge of the business, even when he was a young dude, when he first came to Georgia, he had so much knowledge, natural scent for the business. So that... That had to help you later on in your career too, as you as you as you uh, became a booker down the line. Yeah, yeah. By being around people like that and being smart enough to listen to them and watch them. Were you were you the one that was always asking questions, Eric, uh, to guys? I know when you were down here, you was always wanting to what what made this watch tick, you know? And, uh, yeah, yeah. Every everywhere, always because I wanted to learn it. I wanted to be the best at it. Because I knew just being a wrestler wasn't where all the money's at. Maybe he is today, but not the big money. But uh, I just, yeah, I, I did that everywhere with uh, people I had confidence in. Was your plan always to end up being a booker? I mean, was that? I mean, because you because you realized you realized right away that promoting shows was where the money was. You promoting shows, you made a lot of money, more a lot more than you made certainly trying to break in the business. Yeah. Did you realize the same thing about Booker? Was that always your long-term goal? After I figured out what a Booker was. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, take, it, it, took, it takes us all a while to figure out what, what is a Booker? What, what's a Booker do? Yeah, what, what's a Booker do? <laughs> oh, you just write down these names for matches and da-da-da. But, yes, that I wanted to come up to that level. And uh, where is uh, – Joe Blanchard uh, gave me my first uh, – opportunity of that uh, you know we had that big run in southwest and uh luke williams was booking and uh he, he was smart enough to know that they'd ran their course and carlos wanted him in puerto rico really bad and uh, they finished up there and joe said okay you're the booker i was like oh boy all right this is gonna be fun what and we did that? okay did, 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 did you campaign for the job or did he just come out did he just come out of the blue what, yeah, what, 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 what was you doing, Eric? You had to be doing something to get the eye of Joe Blanchard because Joe was a very, very bright man, very smart man. You had to be, you had to, you had to be a backstage leader. You had to be one of the guys that they, there's, a, there's guys in every locker room that, uh, that all everybody goes to to kind of run their thing by them and stuff like that. You must have been that guy in, in San Antonio. Yeah, Joe, Joe and me become really good friends while I was there. So much so that uh, Tully. Uh, I don't know if the word jealous would be the right word, but uh, there was a lot of animosity there. And uh, back when uh, I just, I, I, the wife wasn't with me there. 
uh, and I had a lot of extra time, you know, that guys do. And uh, we, you can look at me and tell that I didn't go live in the gym. <laughs> so I'd go, I'd go to the office and uh, play with Joe. And uh, back in the day, you know, we had uh, USA Network before Vince had. Right, yeah. And uh, it got to where uh, paying for it, you know, it wasn't free. We're paying for it. And Joe was teaching me this stuff. And uh, I bought, uh, took over Corpus Christi uh, with the Dr. Bowman buddy there. And so that part of the territory was mine. I was promoting running it. And uh, to, to help pay for USA Network, we uh, did uh, mail order commercials during the show and uh, had a little gym bag and had the logo of the wrestling babies that uh, Fritz used and stuff later and a, a towel and a headband and I don't remember what we sold them for but you know it's like call in and order and uh, so many a nights I would spend all night at the offices packing these little boxes and labeling them and have them ready to ship out the next day when Joe got there at the money to do the postage and uh, that's what kept us uh, going there for a long time and then uh, I can remember, Jerry, were you in, uh, were you wasn't with Vince yet, were you, no. when he got to USA? No, I, I uh, no, no, I wasn't with Vince yet, no. Yeah, because uh, Pat O'Connor, Pat O'Connor, no, uh, Pat, New York, called and talked to Joe, and uh, Vince wanted to buy the spot. He wanted uh, you. Pat Patterson, you're talking about. Pat Patterson, yes. And uh, <clears throat> Joe come to me, <clears throat> Luke wanted to do it. Luke Williams said, let's do it, let's do it, let's do it. And uh, I'm like, ah, I'm afraid to, I don't want to. And uh, Joe Blanchard, he didn't want to. So Luke and Joe are arguing and uh, Joe says, okay, Eric, you decide. You call Pat and tell him yes or no. So long story short, I was the one that called Pat Patterson back and told him, no, you can't have it. Screwed me out of ever having a chance at New York probably then, but I didn't know any better then. And they weren't gonna take over the world then. It just was impossible and wasn't gonna happen. And a few months later, Vince had cut a deal with USA and took our spot. Wow. He didn't have to buy it from us. <laughs> I Eric, think he you, paid you, the back bill. Do you remember what I, it cost to get USA Network? <clears throat> I'm wanting to think like 18 or 2000, uh, a show. It's somewhere along in there, I don't remember exactly. Nothing like it would be today. Right. I'm just curious. That's just it's, it's funny yeah. how the numbers that you come it, and go. It, that, that, yeah, it was it, it was in the teens. It was in the teens, and I I don't know why 18 pops up in my head, but it was somewhere along in there. The, and that's that's per week. There was a, a rumor that the, the match with Terry Funk and uh, Tully uh, caused USA to go toward Vince. Uh, was there any truth to that, or did Vince just buy it? I'm talking about the match Vince, they did, the, the, the Cal Lott match, whatever it was like that. That, that was the rumor that that was what precipitated Vince getting it. Uh, you no, know, I never heard that. It might have been the uh, thing that USA used uh, because they were going to use for an excuse or something but uh, we were having mega trouble paying and uh, for so long USA didn't care that we were behind but then Vince uh, appeared to USA and says I want it and uh, then we wouldn't do a deal with Vince for him to, to take it and uh, the uh, I can't remember. God, it's too long ago. <clears throat> but we were way, not just a few thousand dollars behind the USA. You know, I'm, I'm thinking like 40, 50, 60, 70,000 behind in paying. And Vince come in, paid the bill. And USA did offer Joe uh, a payoff. You know, they, they offered him. So, that rumor you heard is not true because USA offered, uh, okay, you pay this that you owe, or Vince McMahon is going to pay it, and he's going to supply the program. 
Gotcha. And we couldn't pay it. We couldn't pay it. That's right. exactly what happened there. You know, that's such a yeah, met- time because Vince, Vince was not just buying up talent. He was buying up TV. You know, that, that's one thing yeah. he's, he's buying up assets right. essentially. So he wasn't just getting Piper and, and uh, Hogan and he was getting USA and then TBS, you know, it was a, it was a, a concentrated plan to, to get USA oh, and yeah. talent with him. <laughs> very, very smart man. Very right. smart man. You, you, you mentioned Luke Williams, uh, one of the, one of the uh, bushwhackers there. Uh-huh. Butch, Butch is a very sharp guy, a very sharp bit. Was he was he working in the office at that time with you, Eric, or what? What was his role? Luke Luke was Luke yeah. Luke was booking. Yeah, Luke was booking. Luke was the booker, and he was trying to teach me how to be a booker. And uh, was that your was that your first experience of trying to be a booker? Yes, yes. And uh, when uh, Luke left and went to Puerto Rico. Then uh, that's when I got the book in San Antonio for Joe. Was the USA that much of a benefit to you more so than say having a, a local television? Because you guys weren't well, running we had, out of your territory, right? You just you had the national television, but exactly, exactly. But Tully, Tully didn't want to let go of USA for whatever reason. Well, it was good for the town. It was good for Tully's career because Tully was not only getting over in San Antonio, it was getting over across the country, everywhere USA Network went. That that right. was the whole whole thing behind that, uh, wanting, wanting, wanting that national territory. Uh, yes. TV what wasn't so much it's going to help my local territory. It's going to help me <laughs> as, a, as, a, as a talent go anywhere I want to go and be over. Right, right. And, uh, you know, when Vince got USA, Boy, the plan started coming together then, uh, didn't it? Yeah, did they? <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir, buddy. We had a very similar situation uh, when I went to Sportatorium right at, right after you, uh, Eric. You you may have got the deal with uh, ESPN. You know, we 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 were we were getting over nationally. We weren't making any money. <laughs> we were getting over nationally. Really. Yeah, 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 you know, we had the ESPN, so our show was uh, global wrestling was showing on ESPN, and uh, so a lot of people knew us, and it actually was great for the talent, but it didn't help the promotion any, you know, because there wasn't a local, we didn't have great local television. Oh. And, yeah, yeah, I see what you're saying. I'm talking but about that for the this, talent, you know, it, it, we didn't we didn't see talent. a check from uh, ESPN or anything. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the talent didn't, but Max Andrews and Jerry Jarrett did when I was there. You know, Max was the uh, the TV guy, and uh, what do you call it? the syndication guy? And uh, I had somebody from Tennessee—I don't want to mention a name—come to me and said, uh, "Do you realize Jerry and Max are taking a ten thousand dollar a week salary a piece out of syndication money?" I said, I didn't realize we were getting anything for syndication. <laughs> so I went to little man who, that's Jerry. I went to little man a little, just a little bit later and uh, I got a decent raise. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yep. So, so take, us, take us to San Antonio. So uh, Vince came in and, 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 and uh, bought you. What happened to your territory at the time? What, 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 was, the, what was going on there? It... Uh, after the sheep herders left, Luke and Butch, and, uh, you know, Luke, we had some big shows, uh, $50,000, $60,000 gates at the Hemisphere Arena and so forth. And, uh, you know, Luke had connections uh, to outside talent. Uh, like, God, I remember Larry Zabisco come in for a show. Uh Oh my goodness, Carlos Colon. Uh, I had the little <clears throat> Mexican connections. I'd bring in Mascaris and some of the Mexican boys I'd worked with out of Mexico. And uh, after Luke left, we Luke went to book Puerto Rico. And as Luke was leaving, it's I'm going to be calling you shortly. <laughs> and uh, Anyway, after uh, Luke got situated in Puerto Rico and stuff, he called and money was triple what I was making. And uh, so I uh, got with Joe and we worked it out and I went to Puerto Rico. And then I think the guy's name was Fred Bastine. 
bought Southwest Wrestling from Joe and uh, didn't have a clue, and it just down to nothing very shortly and out of business. Now, when Joe so did, you had part of San Antonio, you had a percentage of, the, did you get any, were they paying you, or was that part of your money too? No, no, and that was out of Corpus Christi was my town. <clears throat> and uh, when I left, I just, I actually gave it all back to Joe. And, you know, the way I got Corpus Christi is I went and paid the back TV bill there for the local Corpus TV. And uh, he was happy to give it to me to get the, the town back and running. So I just, I gave it back to him. And, and Joe was a good one. Once the territory got, you, you left, went to Puerto Rico, the territory got sold. Uh, was that, were you, were you there with Dutch Mantel as well? In Puerto Rico? Yeah. No, I think Dutch was booking after I had uh, been gone. Right. I don't remember being in Puerto Rico with Dutch. <clears throat> uh, I booked Puerto Rico twice, maybe three different times. So, you know, we're talking a long time ago. We're talking uh, early, mid-80s, mid I guess, maybe, when I first went to Puerto Rico. And uh, it was like I was following Luke. And then, you know, after uh, Luke... Uh, the Sheepers did their run there, and uh, Butch broke his ankle, and uh, it was time for them to finish up. Uh, then Carlos gave me the book for Puerto Rico. Well, well, did okay. those guys have heat down there? Were they over the Bushwhacker, the, the Sheepers? <laughs> they, they were so over it, unbelievable. I remember a tag match I had with them, Jack and I had with them down there. It was one of the hottest, hottest atmospheres I'd ever been involved in. I was shocked, you know, because because I did, I was used to seeing them as good old guys, and that band down there, they turned it up a notch or two. Yes, yes. It uh, <clears throat> the uh, you know you can hear the guys talk about how dangerous, but the guys that haven't been there don't know how dangerous. Uh, I mean, with that, no exaggerating, no BS. At least two, if not more, times of the week, you're in a bad riot and fight through the crowd to get back in the dressing room and then there for hours till the cops can get you out or the people leave. I mean, that was a norm and not, not, not the same buildings, different buildings. It, it oh my gosh, it, uh, I got smart there. I had bleached blonde hair, not old gray hair man now, but uh, I, I got the, the punk hairspray. I found black. I didn't know what, it, well, I just stumbled across it in a Walgreens by my condo and now, when I would go out, not just wearing a hat, I had long blonde hair, I'd spray my hair black when I'd go to the grocery store to go eat, do anything, and nobody recognized me, and <laughs> life became so much easier, so much easier. But, I mean, they, 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 what a dangerous place, though. Yeah. It's a wonder more people didn't get hurt yeah. bad. And what, but what a fun place, too. Was. I mean, uh, was fun. Oh, the girls knew how to party. Oh my gosh! And the beaches were beautiful. Oh, and it, it and every trip was a short trip. It didn't matter if you was on the other side or other end of the island. Every you know didn't take long to get there. And business was it, good, right? Yeah, business good. was great. Very good. Yes, very good. I don't know uh, uh, what what everybody was making, but I was tickled to death to be there. Uh, but I for, for those for those that are watching that don't know, Puerto Rico was a really hot territory when you were down there. I, tell yes. about some of the sizes of the crowds that you guys had in the stadium shows. Oh, on our Sunday big show in Hiram Beatham, Hiram Beatham, thirty thousand people. Uh, <laughs> the Burbank Hotel Committee, the same thing. Yeah, a little less maybe, but well, more people on the floor. Yeah. You go down, yeah. go down to my Wes, you know, they had a decent size building. It'd be five, six thousand people there, which was a sellout. Yeah. Agua de Apache. Apache was a Apache was a big money maker. We 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 go ahead. Jack and I would always keep it a secret. Why do you guys go to Puerto Rico so much? You know, hell, you know, the money was great. And uh, you know, and if you could get out of the ring, you 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 get to the dressing room, you were safe. So uh 
And we just enjoy going down there, guys. We wouldn't tell guys what kind of money we're making. Down there. <laughs> we don't want to run, run the deal for ourselves. Man. Right, right. It, it was uh, an awesome place. The Carlos Cologne is. Yeah. Uh, Carlos was a great guy to work for, too. Right, great. I mean, he was honest. He never lied to me about anything. He always paid me very well to what I thought was very well. And he probably thought he was paying me too much, but I thought he was doing a good job. <laughs> and, uh, I say on one run there, I saved up enough money to open a seafood restaurant back at home in wow. Florida, actually in Valdosta, right across the line uh, with the first wife out of one run there and uh, had a good run with it. And then things in life happened to wrestlers and she went a different way. <laughs> <laughs> You, you were friends. I saw an interview you did. You were friends with uh, Invader and with Brody, right? Were, were you there during the whole thing with Brody? Well, <clears throat> I wasn't there the night it happened, but I was there in the lead up to it. And I'm just, I'm just going to shoot straight and hope I don't make anybody mad. But if uh, I knew something was going to happen eventually and I didn't know. What, 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 what was the heat, Eric? I hate to jump in on the on this great story, but what, 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 what was the buildup? to you, you, you felt something was going to happen. What, where was the push and where was the, 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 the heat coming from? I, I don't know why, other than F him, I hate him. Frank would beat the piss out of Jose yeah. time after time after time. And, you know, Frank worked rough. He kind of like yeah, worked yeah. like uh, JBL there. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> and uh, you, well, you believed your stuff. We believed your stuff, JBL, just like we believed Brody was laying them in because, you know, he would. And, uh, I, I mean, I couldn't count the number of times I would go to Frank and say, Frank, please, <laughs> please don't hurt him tonight. Please don't do your stupid shit tonight with him please. And he'd come back to the dressing room laughing. <laughs> Jose would come to the office the next day, show me his back, show me his legs. Oh my God. i not just, not whelps, bruised, black, red. And uh, you know, one night Frank took his boot off and beat him up with the, not the, the boot part, but the foot part, you know, the, the sole. And boom, boom, boom. He liked to beat him to death. And uh, Oh, over the years, I've learned, and I didn't know then, that for whatever reason, uh, Frank had really hurt Jose up in New York years before for some reason. <clears throat> I, I didn't know anything about that. I just knew that Frank was beat the shit out of Jose all the time. And uh, the Puerto Rican mentality, Jose didn't cry about it. He just took it and tried to give it back. And... Uh, I'd be uh, working on it, laying out a big show in the office and stuff. As Jose, uh, I can get Brody this weekend uh, for this show. And, uh, oh, amigo, please, amigo. And then Carlos would come. I'll work with him. I'll work with him. And uh, so anytime I could get Jose and Brody apart, I would keep them apart. If it made sense for the program and we're going to make big money, Jose said, amigo, I'll do it. I'll do it. And they work together. Do you, ever, do you ever find out why Brody did Brody not like him, or is that was that what what it was? Yeah, Frank. You know, as tight as Frank and me were, uh, he never would tell me other than I f and hate him. I f and hate him. I don't know why. I don't know the reason. Don't know the reason. So this this had been building for a few months before before it actually happened. Then yes, I mean no, a few years, two, two years. three years. Yeah, because I'd been gone for a while <clears throat> when all that, I was in Texas then. And uh, uh, yeah, because I was in Oklahoma the night they come in the dressing room and told me. I thought, was, you, oh, was you surprised when you heard it? or? I, well, I was surprised that it went that far. Mm -hmm. I wasn't surprised that something had happened. Not, not at all surprised. Because to me, it was a ticking time bomb. And uh, something was going to happen. But, you know, you go to both of them, and uh, I, don't, I don't know what I could have said or anybody could have said to uh, have kept that. 
because you know, they would come in and you could have a conversation with them going over the finish, laying out the match, whatever. And they're talking to each other back and forth. So it, it just, the whole thing, you know, Harley race. I saw one time said the best that I've heard it said. And, uh, he said, you know, Frank has a way, had a way about bringing bad things on to himself. And the more I thought about that, the more sense that that statement Harley made 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 sense to me. Well, Frank, Frank was a very, very aggressive guy. I mean, uh, all the time that I knew him, and I, I got along with him uh, wonderfully, and uh, and appreciated him. I had friendship all the time, and like, we we, mm -hmm. we 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 traveled together. We we uh, joked around together. We had, we had a good time together. But Frank, Frank could piss people off big time, <laughs> and, and with, with just just a word, I mean, and just and body, and Frank's body language too. But, and he would do it I on mean, purpose. He would do yeah, it on purpose. Exactly. Yeah. Him, him and Mike Graham, Mike Graham. I mean, uh, God bless them both, but uh, they didn't get along at all. Man, Mike was scared to death that Frank would would blow up on him at any time. It wouldn't have been a pretty sight either, either but. Uh, but uh, yeah, Frank. Frank was like a great guy if if he liked you. But if he was on, oh, if you were on his bad side, you didn't want to be in the same locker room with him. No, not at all. Not at all. He just, uh, God love him. It just, so you know, so uh, so so uh, you know we 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 miss you. You 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 you're in Texas. When did when did you make a trip down to Florida and and meet the Briscoe brothers? <laughs> Hold on. Wasn't it, wasn't it early 80s? Could have been. It, well, I'm, 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 bad on, I'm bad on yours. It was after Oklahoma. After I worked with uh, Lou, had took the book in Oklahoma. I come out of Mexico and went to Oklahoma where Lou was. And for Lou and whoever got into it and Lou's left, he's leaving, tells me bye and tells me to please just stay there and make money. I said, there ain't no money here. Okay. And uh, Ricky Romero come in booking. I got my ch first check from Ricky and was horrible. And then I worked a few more days. You know how your check, you, you work two or three days right. before yeah, uh, you get the check from the back one right. to <clears throat> keep people from leaving. And uh, I called Florida and uh, talked. I don't you know, Jerry, I might have talked to you. I don't know who I talked to that gave me a starting date for I, like. I think, I think it was me. I think it was. And uh, so I uh, I was uh, tag team champions with though, an Indian, Frank Hill. And uh, I thought, okay, these guys owe me this money. I know I'm never going to get it if I leave. And I think it was like three or four nights. And uh, so I took the tag belt with me and come to Florida. <laughs> and uh, first damn TV at the Sportatorium, Jerry Briscoe, this, this living legend in my mind. He walks up to me. And he says, uh, hey, buddy, uh, have you got the uh, tag belt from Oklahoma? I <laughs> yeah. said, yes, sir, sure do. He said, well, uh, I think I can get you to send that back to him. I said, uh, no, sir. He said, I can't. <laughs> and I said, well, they owe me. He said, oh, wait a minute, how, what do they owe you? How much do they owe you? And I said, well, they owe me for, I think it was three nights, da, da, da. And uh, I said, a typical payoff from them for those three nights would be, I don't remember what, $125, $150. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> he said, okay. I said, uh, I'll tell you what I'll do, Mr. Briscoe. I'll send that belt back to them COD. I'll give them one chance to take it. He said, it's all you got to do. And boom, I charged them, put a bill in there that. for the shipping, the tape, the scotch tape, the packing tape. And the carrier charges. <laughs> yep. And I, I just, my, my, my three payoffs, not inflated, a payoff that I thought that they would actually screw me and give me for that town. And boom, and uh, got my damn check in the mail. And sent the belt back. So it was after Oklahoma. So it'd been 82, 83, somewhere along in there, probably. 
Well, Florida was a, was a really unique territory at that time, too, because we were struggling a bit, uh, too. You know, all the stars uh, you know, weren't aligned at, at the right time. But uh, we, 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 the we, stars we, we, were, the we, stars we, we, were aligned for me. They were aligned <laughs> for me coming there then. <laughs> so hey, tell, Jerry, tell, what, tell phone, Jerry what was the phone call you got from Oklahoma? I got a phone call. I I, I think it was directly. Uh, Eddie got the phone call. Number one, Eddie got the phone call, and of course passed it on to me. And Leroy called Eddie, and I, you know, I had talked to Leroy in a long time. And quite honestly, there was a little animosity when Jack and I left Oklahoma because Leroy broke us in. Leroy thought he had us for life, though, like he did Daddy, you know. And uh, and we we we, we wanted bigger lights than that, than what Oklahoma had to offer. So. Uh, I hadn't talked to Leroy in years, so I called Jerry, Leroy. In fairness, in Jerry, in fairness, everybody wants to leave Oklahoma. <laughs> Not that I wanted to leave God. I had to leave. <laughs> everybody who's got a car leaves Oklahoma. <laughs> I had a Grand Prix Pontiac, man. I left Oklahoma. And so anyway, I'm down here. So I called Leroy just to, just to kind of catch up with him and uh, see, see what the hell was going on in there. And he said, well, the reason we're calling and talking here is, is not because of you, believe you and your brother leaving me, because Eric Emery has my championship belt. <laughs> he went in how he had the belt. I think he had it made down in Mexico, too, had one of those expensive belts from Mexico. He said, if he'll just give that back to me, I, I won't I won't I won't do anything. He said, but I just I just can't see you guys promoting him as an MWA mem member and, and not me 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 not having my belt there. So that's what I went to Eddie, and Eddie said he wants his belt back. And Eddie said, "We'll get it back, no matter what it takes." He, he, Eddie kind of came in. If, we probably would have paid him the hundred and fifty or whatever, whatever. I think it was around one hundred and fifty bucks at the time to, to, yeah. to, to buy it off there. But Eric, Eric was true to his word, and and uh -huh. uh, and, and sent the belt back, and then we went on, and and, and that kind of opened up a friendship with me and Eric because I could I could see Eric was a man of his word at that time, so. Eric was involved in one of the one of the all time great Florida ribs out here on, on my ground that Ed, Eddie to his dying day was still wasn't too happy about. So Eric, you what kind of run run that by him? John, you got to listen to this. This, this, has gotta be, this has to be one of, if not the. This is the promoter's son. Yeah. The, the greatest rib in the history of professional wrestling. Are you ready? <laughs> Absolutely. We, we and, uh, I, you know, I got a little push getting over in Florida a little bit, you know, best I knew how and this and that kind of a mid card, upper mid card. And, uh, Mike and me just, we didn't get along and, uh, don't know why I didn't care to know why, but anyway, we're in, uh, <clears throat> Lakeland, Florida. I'll never forget this night till they bury me. Nice, big arena, thousands of people, big house. All right, a battle royal at the end. The winner faces Ric Flair for the world title on the next show. And it's a pole battle royal. Whoever can go up the pole and get the gimmick is the winner of the battle royal. Faces Flair. All right. <clears throat> Back in the dressing room. Now, Funk, Dory Funk Jr. had uh, just come in, hadn't been there two or three weeks, and replaced J.J. Dillon uh, as the booker. So, <clears throat> got to finish the battle world. Everybody together gave finishes, da da da. And uh, Mike is going up the pole and win the battle world. So, okay. Now, a little bit later, <clears throat> Jack and Jerry holler at me. Hey, come here. I'm like, wow, what do they want? Jack and Jerry Briscoe wants to talk to Eric Gimbrey? Cool. <laughs> and uh, we get over there and they said, you know, Jack says, you know, it'd be funny if that little shit couldn't make it up that pole. <laughs> I'm like, huh? what are you talking about? <clears throat> so he explains in uh, more uh, younger person details to me. And uh, he said, you know, if you put some oil on you and you climbed up that pole first and rubbed that oil on that pole he might have trouble getting up it i said yeah i don't know i said you know I, and i told jack or jerry i told him i said you know i'd have to have an alibi 
Because, you know, if I get caught doing something like this, I'm history, you know. And Jack said, alibi? Jerry and me both going to beat shit out of you if you don't do it. <laughs> so Jack had I think it might have been Marlboro, whatever he was smoking. Marlboro, uh, man. The cell- Marlboro man. Yeah, the cell cellophane package off the bottom. I said, give me this. He gave that to me. I got my bottle of baby all squirt, twisted it all up. Jack or Jerry, one of them got a little piece of tape, helped me tape it. Oh, okay. I'm getting in my mouth. It's okay. <clears throat> we got to play it. Jack and Jerry's going to keep everybody away from the pole at the start of the battle royal. And yeah, they do. I come flying across the ring, corner to corner, right up the ropes and jump, grab the pole, and I spit the gimmick out in my hand. Brother, when I spit it out and busted it, I come down that pole ass over tea kettle 900 miles long. No. Yeah. I, I come down on top of Onita, the Japanese guy. And he go like, oh, Embry, oil, oh, Embry, no good. Oil, oil. And I snatched him and he understood KP. <clears throat> okay, it gets better. Nobody, everybody's trying now because nobody can get up the pole. Nobody can get up the pole. Nobody, and it, it's kind of a joke until it gets down and the finish don't work because Mike can't get up the pole, can't get up the pole. Now, probably 20 minutes pass, not exaggerating. People are going, bullshit! My little girl could climb that pole! Bullshit! And uh, Funk Jr. is pulling what little Harry has out in the back. He's like, God, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? What are we going to do? And Jerry or Jack come up with an idea and uh, give Jerry a t-shirt. And Jerry takes the t-shirt down to the ring, gives it to Mike. They do a spot. There's only three of them left to do a spot. He tries to climb the pole with the t-shirt. Looks stupider than he tried without it. <laughs> yeah, Mike, Mike's forearms are like pie pies at this time. <laughs> you know, people are getting up leaving. The, the <laughs> arena is leaving. And another five, ten minutes. I mean, long time goes by. Junior is having a heart attack in the back. <laughs> and then Jerry and Jack end up going down to the ring, climbing up on the turnbuckle, helping Mike get up on the shoulders and win. And I swear to you, over half the arena had already said bullshit and left. <laughs> <clears throat> Mike comes back in the dressing room, took his tape off, stowing stuff. Most embarrassing effing night of my life. It's the most embarrassing effing night of my life. I'm still over going, hee hee, and I caused it. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that was, that was oh boy, that was. So good. Jerry, did I'm people then, not realize that the the pole had been greased? After a while, they did because nobody could get up it, and it, it was shiny where they were there. But uh, Eric did it just perfectly. He went up, you know, uh, just a little bit, you know, where, where if you, if you actually if you if you were able to get up above where the oil is, it was it was clean, and you could do it there. But. Uh, Jack and I started thinking on that after it's over. We, you know, and, and Jack, Jack, being the man that he is, a big bit of coward that I am. I said, I'm not going to do it. Jack went out to Lakeland at at, at, a, at the phone bank there. Back there, there's no cell phone. There's a big, big, uh, long phone bank there. Jack called Eddie and, and told Eddie what had happened because he was trying to protect Eric. He didn't want Eric getting in trouble because we knew, well, and they're going to pinpoint it down. But we're having a lot of trouble at the time with the rope. You know, back that was back in the oil days where everybody was old enough. I'm sure you old up a lot too, John. I've seen pictures of you where you're just shining. And so we're having trouble with with a lot of guys using too much oil. So that was really our, our thing on the thing because Mike Mike could go out and he'd have a gallon of baby oil on it, right? Right there. Yeah. And so Jack called Eddie and told Eddie, "Hey, we played a joke. It kind of backfired on us. It was it was Mike involved in it." But this is what happened, and they, and no shape or form was it was it Eric's idea or Eric's doing it was it was my Jack Jack said it was my idea, so it kind of it was since it was Jack, it kind of got you know pushed aside there. But but I'm Mike Mike bad. Mike hated Mike hated us forever because of that. Really? <laughs> yeah, and the, and the boys loved us because Mike, you know, because Mike, you know, he, you know, cocky bantam rooster there, you know. <clears throat> 
and I always arrogant and cocky and cocky. And the guys loved us just to see Mike struggling and seeing the forearm blow up like that. Well, it was great. It was great. I, I did get my notice two or three weeks later, but that was okay. It was, it was, it was, you had just pulled the greatest rib ever. So. <laughs> it was perfect. Was oh, Eddie was bad, tough. Jerry? Yeah, Eddie was mad at a hog, man. But, you know, and fortunately, Lincoln was a good town. A month later, we went in with Mike and Mike and Rick or Mike and Harley. I can't remember which two it was, but whichever combination it was, we had another cell out there. So all was forgotten. You know, it's just kind of just <laughs> one of those nights that would go down and only the guys know how funny it was, you know. <laughs> yeah. It was. Oh. Yeah. Well, hey, Eric, what a Eric, what when a did the boys start yeah. figuring out the pole was grease? Oh, it didn't take them long because, like I said, you know, there, there was Eric, Eric and his big ass, he could only get a certain, a certain amount up the pole. It was one of those big, long uh, damn poles, too. And uh, and we wanted to do it backstage, but Eric Eric, Eric actually came up with the idea, better idea of putting, putting the oil in, let, let, letting him uh, scrub. And he was the only guy that we knew we could go to that wouldn't stooge it all and wouldn't, wouldn't turn the mic and and because uh, Eric, Eric was like that. We, we knew. He would he wouldn't suit us off either. So uh, no, that's really that's the reason Eric was chosen to do it. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, the board the board found out the board after a while uh, they didn't even you know well, nobody was even trying to go up the pole. And if they were, they would stand on each other's shoulders. So a lot of guys you, you get real creative in situations <laughs> like that. And a lot of the boys were just having fun with it and working with it, you know. So. Yeah, it was super. It was shame it wasn't on TV, a pay per view on TV or something. Oh, we would have never done it. Oh, no, no, yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Yeah. But that way, where we could watch it back, it would have ten million hits on YouTube. Yeah, it would have. <laughs> but you know, Jerry, Florida was such a fun place. I mean, my gosh, I learned so much there. You know, JJ was pushing me. And uh, gosh, Coco Samoa, <clears throat> you remember Coco? Oh, Coco, yeah, Coco was over, yeah. Um, me and he, I had a van, he had a van. We both were living in our beach on the causeway, not the big bridge that goes to St. Pete, but the other one yeah. a little bit further down, yeah, big sandy beach. We lived on our in our vans on the beach, and uh, God, you open the doors. The van in the morning when you wake up, we go down to the bait shop and get the biggest shrimp they got. We don't catch a fish in a few minutes. Coco's built a fire and we eat our bait. We eat the shrimp. <laughs> Gosh. <clears throat> it, uh, what, oh, man. It was just so many, so many stories. Uh, Bubba Douglas. He oh, lived in the Lakeland. Our, our rare mayor of Lakeland, yeah. Yeah, yeah. In uh, Fort. I don't remember the town. Golly, Fort Myers. No, Fort Myers on the other coast. It was no, a little Fort, Fort Myers on, on, on our coast, on our side. On the Tampa side? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's where it, was. it had the arena had uh, like three decent sized lakes behind. Yeah, it. yeah. The guys used to chase the alligators around down there. Yeah, yeah. I caught the biggest bass of my life there. Me and Bubba went down early to fish one time and uh, the plastic worm. And just as I'm standing at the edge, just as I'm raising it up, thing bass about took me in the thing. And uh, old Fonzie, he put it in the cooler and took it and weighed it the next day. And it was 714 or 713 wow. the next day. Wow. That thing was big as me. Oh, my gosh. John, John, John probably threw rocks in those uh, in those ponds chasing the gator because we would we used to do TV down there. Remember all the guys would go out to those ponds. There were gators oh, yeah, in those ponds. And, yeah, yeah, throw yeah. bait, go throw bait toward them there. <laughs> wow, yeah. wow. So when did at uh, what point did you end up in Texas, Eric? Because <clears throat> okay, well, it comes from Frank in Puerto Rico. Uh, I had. Uh, Opened a restaurant and uh, had uh, pretty much retired. <clears throat> and uh, I, I would go make a big show for Carlos on, you know, how he does on the weekends. Right, Some yeah. weekends he had big shows. So I'd go for a night or two nights. And uh, I was in uh, uh, that weekend and I was in a little, little dressing room, probably eight foot, eight foot, with Abdullah. 
and Brody come walking in and shut the door behind him. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, what's going to happen here? <clears throat> and uh, Frank, he was telling me he just took over the book in Dallas with Fritz. And uh, he said, I need you in Dallas. I need you. Why don't you come to Dallas to work for me? And I was like, Frank, I'm through. I'm just returning favors to Carlos because uh, he helped me do all this. And he said, and I didn't help you. And uh, he said, every time you, every time you call me to come over to Puerto Rico for you, I came, I did. And da, 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 da. And I said, well, I said, let me think about it. And uh, he said, well, uh, I've got an idea uh, for a gay gimmick, gay gimmick. I said, hell no. I said, that idea is, that's not even an option. I ain't going, I ain't coming. And he said, well, uh, we can work around that. I said, I guarantee it. So anyway, I went home, talked to the wife, blah, blah, blah. So I'm going to go to Dallas for Frank and uh, told him like it's like a three month deal and uh, went and uh, we compromised on instead of gay, is he or isn't he? Is he or he could be? Had a powder box and I'd powder your face after I beat you. Dumbest thing. I oh, I was so embarrassed doing that. But anyway, uh, I got out of that gimmick after three or four TVs because I started dumping the whole powder box. And I have a whole thing of powder in it and it take them 30 minutes to clean it up out of the rain. So they took the powder box <laughs> away from me and I was happy. <laughs> but that that's how I got there. And uh, it just kind of <clears throat> progressed from there. Uh, I was uh, leaving one time and Gary Hart, I had become really good friends with Gary Hart. And uh, uh, it's just one of them. I've had enough. I can't take it no more. The boys, the Von Erics are driving me nuts and I didn't even, I was just one of the boys. And, uh, so I stopped by Gary's apartment to tell him bye. And, uh, he said, no, 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 you cannot leave. And I said, hi, brother, I'm just telling you bye. I'm gone. And, uh, so he went in the house. He said, wait a minute, went in, come back out, got in my van. I said, you going to Florida with me? He said, no, we're going to the Sportatorium. I said, I'm through. He said, no, Fritz wants to talk to you. So anyway, <clears throat> ended up going to the Sportatorium and uh, went upstairs with Gary to Fritz's. And he said, so you're leaving? I said, yes, sir. I've had enough. Can't handle anymore. And he said, well, you screwed up our plans. I said, well, what are our plans? Nobody's clued me into any plans. And uh, he said, well, and Brody and... Uh, uh, Buck Robley are downstairs in the old booking office. He said, well, Gary is taking over the book Monday, was Monday, and you're going to help him. You're going to book with him. And I said, really? And uh, I said, well, what is this going to pay? And we made a deal on money. And he said, all right, Hart, it's, I know it's quicker than what we were going to do, but go down and tell him. So Gary went down and fired Brody and Buck Rogan. <laughs> so the poor guy got me there, and then I took his job, and I feel bad about it. <laughs> but, uh, then, you know, we had it. Uh, territory was horrible, horrible, horrible shape. Oh, my gosh. But uh, was, it, was <laughs> this after the, the great run with all the boys, or, or what, what, when, when was this? Time frame. Oh Lord, I don't know. That it was after, uh, after David had passed, right? Oh yes, after David and Mike had died about uh, a month or two, month and a half after I got there. Mike did his thing, and uh, the uh, then uh, Fritz did a deal with Ken Mantel, which I have often said this on other podcasts <clears throat> the dumbest deal in the history of professional wrestling uh in know, the history Ken had wild in the history ken had wild west wrestling running opposition to fritz and uh so ken made a deal with fritz to take over world class and Ken would be responsible for 100% of the loss against 50% of the profit. Wow. wow. <laughs> yeah. I, I always thought Ken was a bright guy until I heard that deal. Yeah, that's, that's wow. the deal. And Ken could not, could not fire 
Gary or Eric. You have to keep Gary and Eric. And uh, so Ken didn't like uh, his restrictions, but he did the deal. And, uh, you know, uh, we'd have booking meetings at the Sportorum when, you know, Michael was booking for Ken and uh, Eric's uh, eyes for Fritz. Michael, basically. Michael Hayes. Or Michael Michael Hayes. Hayes. Yeah, Michael Hayes. Yep. That's when they did the, uh, the, the Blackbirds. Right. Uh, with Iceman and uh, the Samoan SWAT team with the two of the Samoans. You know, the talent was there, but uh, we weren't making no money. <clears throat> and uh, Fritz, uh, some, Kerry uh, hated, he didn't like Mantel, but Kerry had been coming to Memphis for some shows and had been calling Jerry Jarrett. So, long story short, the deal is Jerry comes down, meets with Fritz, and the deal set up for uh, Fritz takes it back from uh, Mantel and uh, does the deal with Jerry Jarrett. So, Jerry approaches me. I actually picked him up at the airport but, uh, when he come down to meet. But uh, I took over the book for, for Jerry. And here's the, uh, the thing that uh, boggled people's minds that I have finally figured out because Kevin hated Jerry Jarrett. That deal had no possibility of ever working, even though Jerry had control. It was going to be a constant fight as it was with uh, you bought the company, you didn't buy the world-class name, you have to stop using it in 90 days from a court order. That's how I come up with the idea of the uh, PY Chu High USWA versus World Class and change the name because Kevin made us change the name. So we, I just put it in an angle and uh, drew the last sellout in the history of the Sportatorium. And uh, <clears throat> then it was, uh, was the, the other big one was uh, Kevin and the attorneys, uh, were suing Jerry because he misled the boys into a bad deal. And Jerry's lawyers told him that uh, this will be no problem to beat, no problem. But you got to think, if you beat this, you're still partners with them. And Jerry said, no, I'm not. <clears throat> they can have it. I'm back to Tennessee. So, and we, we had the place on fire. We were making money. But Kevin kept digging and digging and digging. And I finally figured out why. And it goes back to Gary Hart. Kevin called Gary Hart, Uncle Gary, and they were tight. I mean, tight. All right. Gary never got on Kevin about anything. He'd always get on Kerry and Kerry would be like a kid got caught in his hand in the cookie jar. But that's just the way you handled those boys. And Gary Hart and Jerry Jarrett, I found out from both of them. I asked both of them, both sides of the story. They got into it in Atlanta when Jim Bart brought Gary Hart in to book Atlanta. Right. Then Gary Hart and Jerry Jarrett had a little samage in the bathroom at the TV station. Uh, Jerry thought he was getting that job. Huh? Jerry thought he was getting that job. Yes. Gary thought he was. Yes. Right. Yep. <clears throat> and uh, so in my mind now, I know why Kevin was so, I hate Jerry Jarrett. He's this, he's that, he's this, he's that. It's because Gary Hart put that in his head. And I love Gary, loved him. But there's no doubt in my mind that Gary Hart didn't stir the pot on his way out. Because when Jerry Jarrett came, Gary packed his stuff. I said, I ain't even going to ask him for it. For him. And uh, I, from there on, it was just... Uh, you know, you, you, you babysit Carrie and uh, uh, try to keep Kevin out of your hair. <laughs> See, that, that's what Gary was really good at babysitting. I mean, as we all know Gary, Gary was fantastic. Gary was, could span, like, span anything. But, uh, you know, I, Gary's a guy that I, I really look up to in, in, in my career, my career development. And Gary had a lot to do with it from, from the very beginning, from Australia trip to, uh, 
to Florida, to Carolinas, and I always had a lot of a lot of respect for Gary. But I also knew Gary was one of those flip flop man, man from from Chicago, and that could spend those cell there. How 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 was your how was your time with Gary? And I'm, the guy was a complete genius when it came to this business, though. Yes, yes, he was. <clears throat> he he knew how to draw money. He knew how to uh, uh, explain to you how to work your gimmick, and uh, very 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 smart. <clears throat> but you had to be careful that he wasn't uh, giving you something just to benefit the Gary Hart character. Right, yeah. That makes sense. Yeah, and that was Gary. I know Gary very well. Yeah, you're right on that. But <laughs> I he, learned a lot from him. Yeah, you, a lot from him. if you've got an open mind, you're going to learn from Gary Hart. I don't know, John, how what kind of experiences you had around Gary, but uh, he, he was a very extremely bright man. Yeah, same. I roomed, I roomed with Gary uh, a couple yeah, times on the, we were running South Texas. I was working out of yeah, yeah. Uh, Dallas. I can't remember who was running it. Maybe, maybe Crockett was, was trying to run it. I can't remember. But I roomed with Gary uh, several times, and I'd come stumbling in at 1 or 2 o'clock in the morning. He'd wake up <laughs> as pleasant, pleasant as he could be. He goes, uh, how was your evening, my boy? <laughs> <laughs> he'd, he'd smizz a little and go back to sleep. <laughs> He, uh, it was, yeah. he was the nicest guy. He was a great roommate. I, 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 I loved it. Of course, I, re, I really looked up to him too uh, because I, you know, he had been on TV so much, so much longer before I, I'm just breaking yeah. in the business. It was, it was wonderful to be out there with Gary Hart. Yeah. Yeah. Very, very bright man. Uh, well, uh, Eric, uh, along uh, during this time, there was a guy that was at Chris Adams uh, wrestling school there that, that you, you, you kind of, took a liking to and kind of could foresee the future of this young man there. And it was Stone Cold Steve Austin. Kind of tell us a little bit about the develop early day development of Stone Cold in that territory. Well, the uh, uh, Steve was like you're saying in Chris's school that I helped Chris get set up and uh, deal made with Jerry Jarrett to do the school. And uh, uh, Chris came to me after TV one Saturday morning and uh, said, hey, go up uh, Crow's Nest and uh, take a look at this long blonde haired kid I got, got in school. <clears throat> so I went up the stairs and uh, looked and watched him for a little bit. And I thought, you know, that kid's got something. Didn't, you know, didn't overly get, oh, oh my God, he's going to be great. No, he's, he's, he's not bad. And uh, so I, I caught myself going up to the Crow's Nest up there on Saturday mornings after TV on my own, just to kind of look at, uh, see where he was progressing to. And then I went to Chris after three or four times and uh, told Chris, I said, hey, when's uh, Austin gonna be done with your school? He said, oh, he's got a ways to go. And I said, Chris, well, you're talking to Eric, don't bullshit me. When are you gonna graduate him? Oh, well, he's got, I said, Chris, you're milking him for 50 bucks every week <laughs> and I wanna use it. He said, well, uh, I'll, I'll speed it up. I'll speed it up. I said, next week, I want an answer. So next week, I went to him and told him that, uh, I said, hey, you come up with when you're going to let him graduate? And he said, well, I'm, I said, real simple. Either you talk to him and graduate him, or I'm going to go talk to him and offer him a job. And uh, that's how he got to, through with his school and started working. Because, uh, you know, he, he, he was a good, solid worker. And uh, my, but my alternative motive there was uh, Jeannie, his girlfriend, was a good looking son of a gun who was uh, real friends with Tony Adams, Chris's wife then, because Jeannie had been Chris's first wife that I had been in Mexico with for months. And Dallas had always had girls in the good days figured in precious sunshine that I thought carried the territory more than the birds and the Von Erichs did back in the day. So here's me two beautiful, beautiful, beautiful women that I can have in a program to help support me and Tojo and Akbar and all that. And uh, that that was uh, how it all started. Wow. So I from there, from there who, who did you put Steve with when he first started? How was it about just the uh I, I don't remember exactly i put genie with him right off the bat right right off the bat huh? 
Yeah. Yep. And Chris with Tony and Tony had been with Chris some, but uh, just worked the deal with the girls. Oh my gosh. It, 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 the two girls. And, and it was kind of like sunshine and precious uh, where they didn't know how to wrestle, but it was great. They didn't know how to wrestle because you don't want them out uh, taking back drops and uh, arm drags. You want them cat fight, cat fight. And we drew money with them, did money with them. Eric, and I, had I, the best. To, uh, I, I spoke with uh, James Beard earlier. James has been a long time good friend of mine uh, ever since my first day. He's the first, he's first one to give me a job there at Sport Uh James told me how bad business was when you came in and how hot it got after you'd been there a while. And he said, it's because you took it in a little a different direction. It wasn't just about the Von Eric boys. It was more about uh, so much more about, uh, you know, what you're talking about now. Did Fritz ever acknowledge the fact that you had reinvigorated the business and lit it back on fire? Uh, to a certain extent, uh, it was, uh, Oh, it's the way it used to be. I said, that's my point. <laughs> uh, and, uh, you know, I had uh, Juan, Juan Reynosa, was a referee in San Antonio in uh, Southwest, who uh, worked a Taurus Bulba, shaved his head, Mexican, had the little hair like a Mongo, nice. and had a good run in Puerto Rico with Luke and stuff. And, you know, we'd all we'd been buddies for years. And uh, I finally ran him down. He was working at an IGA in Louisiana. His family had moved there and so forth, doing good, and uh, talked him into coming to world class. This is the only time Fritz has ever bitched at me. And uh, come in as a Taurus Bulba, <clears throat> right off the bat, had I said, uh, Kerry, you could get to do anything you wanted to, but you had to approach him the right way and explain to him how good it's going to be. And uh, Bulba's first night at the Sportatorium, he lays out Kerry with the damn claw, and Kerry gets color, and we carry him out. That white heat took over the Sportatorium. You could hear all the rats scurrying around. It, 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 oh, my gosh. <clears throat> Fritz called me the next day. Oh my gosh. And my cock Fritz, please, if this don't work, you can come down back to the sport tournament and I'll kiss your ass in front of everybody. He might have told that to Vince, and that's how Vince got that kiss your ass club or something. <laughs> but I never had I never had to kiss it because it worked. And then uh uh it wasn't a, probably a month. Juan got homesick, wife sick. <laughs> And uh, he, he told me, he said, I just got to go. I love Babette. I can't be away from Babette. And uh, he did the honors for Kerry, same way, the claw, put the claw over and bonk and gone. But that's the only time Fritz ever uh, uh, hollered and screamed. Eric, you, 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 were, you were there when, when things were just smoking hot, white hot, as we say in the business. But you also were right when, when, when the Ver Von Eric started started declining and what was that like when all of a sudden you know they just you know you have your fill of somebody you know even American Dream here in Florida after a while Dusty realized that when he packed his bags and moved up to uh, Carolina there but after a while no matter how hot you are there there's always that simmer down that that's the hardest part to take when when did you realize that that was happening with the water well when I, when I was there when I first got there with Brody uh that was happening and uh when i when jared come and i took over my mentality was to feature von erics only when you have to only as much as you have to because the people are burned out and tired of them that's all they've ever known in world class and they're ready for something different i was the didn't know who the something different was going to be until Jerry Jarrett told me, he said, you know, this, this uh, deal is so flaky that I have that because of Kevin, he said, we got to have a top baby face and a top baby face we can trust. <clears throat> and I named him a couple. I said, well, there's, you know, we're buddies where he said, no, he said, is there anybody you could trust more than yourself? 
I said, Jerry, I don't want to be. I was middle of the cards, fine for me. He said, no, you tie a rocket to your ass and light it. I said, okay. So that's that was our thanking right off the bat. And uh, I wouldn't even book them on the sportatorium all the time. You know, I said, I figured y'all wanted a night off. Figured y'all wanted to be off. And you had to be fighting so, heat from uh, Fritz at the time when you wasn't booking them on, on the Maddie Village Sportatorium, right? Well, it, he, he, you know, in some un... I think he understood <clears throat> what I was telling him that we need to go a different road for just a little bit and give the people a break. I'm thinking we need to go a different road and stay on it and let the people forget. But I didn't tell him that. And then Fritz actually never, uh, after Jerry came, uh, very, very seldom did I hear from Fritz because Fritz knows he screwed up on the big heart attack at Reunion Arena. And uh, Michael and Ken Mantel, they come up, you know, Fritz is going to fake the heart attack and da 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 Reunion Arena, the big Star Wars, biggest show of the year. And uh, Gary went to Fritz and I went to Fritz and I went back to Fritz by myself and said, and Fritz, please don't do this. Please, the people have had so much down from the Von Erics, from David, from Mike, and this is going to backfire. It's going to backfire. It cannot work. It's going to turn the people maybe completely off the Von Erics. And he said, well, I got, that's what they want me to do. And Ken's paying all the bills. So I feel like I have to do what he wants. I said, who's going to be here when Ken's gone, Fritz? He said, well, I don't do it. Don't do it. And he did it. Fake the heart attack at Reunion Arena. The media picked it up. The fans, are, they picked up this bullshit. He didn't have a heart attack. And uh, Kevin went on and said, oh, nobody said he had a heart attack. But well, hell, they didn't. <laughs> hell, they didn't. <laughs> yeah. And that, that helped put the last nail, one of the last nails in the coffin for world class, I think. And it also hurt with uh, Lance Von Eric, right? When they finally came out and said, this isn't a Von Eric, you know, because I mean, these guys were always, and I'm not, I'm not throwing stones. I, I love the Von Erics and I love uh, Kevin. He's been sure. wonder, wonderful to me. Uh, so was Kerry. Uh, but they, they realized that the Von Erics, who they always had trusted in, now all of a sudden they've got two things here where they've misled them. And, and that was another yes. thing that really hurt, right? With the Lance Von Eric. Yes, yes, yes. And, uh, <clears throat> they thought it would be better to expose him and talk about how they didn't want to do it and they made a mistake and did it. And uh, I, I, that that was a definite nail, yeah, because uh, the people said, uh, uh, you know, basically you just lied to us and now you're you're telling us you lied to us. <laughs> right. You know, you know, you know, through the years and everything, uh, there's one one certain thing that stands out in the Dallas territory more so than than the Von Erichs and more so than than the Hearts and a lot a lot of the big stars there, and that that's the venue itself, the Sportatorium, world famous Sportatorium, which was a dump. I would not, I drove by there. I never went to the inside, so I. It wasn't testify. that nice, Jerry. It had to be nicer to be a dump. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> but what what was so romantically uh charged about that building that that it's now it's 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 spoken of with like the Todd Mahal of, of professional wrestling the uh, acoustics the uh, acoustics uh, is uh awesome awesome the uh the no heat in the uh winter and no air conditioning in the summer you open and turn the fans on <laughs> the uh but uh, and the the way the building is built, I guess, would be the awesome because you've got. Uh, now this, this building wasn't only for wrestling, Eric, right? Uh, Elvis and all the big stars played there in their time. Sure. Michael Hayes had a Freebird concert there, too. Oh, oh, wow. Well, that's Elvis, the complete venue there. <laughs> Elvis and Michael Hayes played there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They uh, take the ropes off the ring, and uh, that's where the. The Kentucky, Kentucky Headhunters or something was there, did a concert there while I was actually in Dallas 
one time. But, the, you know, you've got the, the elevation of the seats going up on all four sides. <clears throat> and uh, you got the ring, probably a, I don't know, 25, 30 foot square floor that the bleachers come down to. And then the ring sets in that. So everything is on top of each other. <clears throat> no bad seat in the house. And, uh, and they got damn rats there. Three, two and a half. Two four, and a half four, 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 four legged rats. The four legged. Yeah, four legged rats. <laughs> two foot long without your tail, Jerry. Oh, my God. Yeah. Oh, man. I, you know, I actually lived in the You lived there before. for a while. Tell us about that experience. Did you have a favorite rat? <laughs> no, it was great. It was great. You know, I didn't, I didn't have to worry about the arena. It's all shut off. I'm in my office, and I've got a dresser. I've got showers, bathrooms, and no utilities or rent. None. <laughs> it, uh, <clears throat> I had a few winos uh, try to do it in. I heard had a story a where you used to go to McDonald's, buy about uh, 25 hamburgers, go and have a party with the winos on, on yep. Friday and Saturday yep. nights. You bet, buddy. Right across the street, uh, a lot of the interstates, yeah. overpasses and yeah. stuff, uh -huh. and a hell of a homeless crew living under those uh, the interstates there. Oh, yeah. I'd, I'd take big bags of uh, McDonald's. It's all I can afford. <laughs> and uh, sit there and party and laugh, and they play music and just, you know, it was cool. It was cool. I, I did that more than a few times. I did it a lot of times. And uh, had a car come, car come through the sportatorium one night, scared me to death. I mean, crashed through it. And, uh, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm surprised the whole building didn't collapse. Yeah. The whole, the front wall of it. Kind of, kind of boom, right through it. Who, 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 uh, owned, who owned the uh, sportatorium? I never did figure out who, who was the owner's uh, for I can't think of his name, but uh, the Sportatorium sat on the corner. And if you're facing the front of the Sportatorium, there's another big building to the left of it across the creek and holler there. <laughs> and that guy owned it. Uh, <clears throat> when uh, Jerry Jarrett come down, we went to see him because they were so far behind on the rent. <clears throat> he was getting antsy and Fritz was uh, gonna have to pay it. And uh, I just, I can't think of his name. He was probably about 80 then. And had big old cowboy hat, had big old cowboy belt buckle. Of course, and, they all, all do. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and up and, uh, gosh, it's right on tip of my tongue. Nice, nice old fella. And uh, we introduced ourselves, with Jerry and I, to him and Bob Bowman. And he said, yeah. And he pulls out his little index card out of the box and says, yeah, uh, Mantel is... Uh, so many thousand behind him paying me. And he said, you know, when Fritz von Eric had this, he never ever was behind or late ever. And he said, I really uh, got, took all this guy I can take. And, you know, our response was, well, the uh, <clears throat> Fritz is taking the business back, man tells out of it now. And who's gonna pay this back bill? And uh, <clears throat> Anyway, Jerry said, well, if we can work out a deal on the building where I can run shows with Fritz there, then I will pay you. And I will write you a check right now. And da, da, da. So anyway, long story short, we worked out a rent, new rent deal. I don't remember what it was, 2000 or something a week, crazy rent. But uh, we uh, come up with a deal with him for $1 per ticket. And uh, that was our rent. And if we had three shows there or four shows there that week then uh you clean up because you get a dollar for any time we have anything in this building dollar a ticket and uh, he was excited about that and he was happy with it and jerry wrote him a check to pay the mantel's old bill and we had the sportatorium then we had to go pay light bills and water bills <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> So he, little man was a few grand into it uh, when he first come in. And I told you, you bring a big checkbook when you come, buddy. Dang stack of bills that tall on the desk. That's why when they did, work, they're talking about did, tearing down. Did, you know, now, now, now Sportatorium, you know, it's tore down. You know, Katie's an industrial, just yeah. an empty lot. I drove by it last time I was around in Dallas and, they're talking about their Jerry. They're going. They're going to try to save it. <laughs> save it. <laughs> you, need, <laughs> you need a nuclear bomb that place. <laughs> yeah. yeah, 
yeah. it was you know what what a run what a territory oh that was you the know, best not, arena not, you're right the people were right on top of you you had to walk down through yeah. them to get to the ring and, and everybody is right on it was what a great arena Yes, yes. And even, you know, the people up at the very, very top on the last bleacher had a perfect view of everything. I mean, there was not no bad place there. No I bad read, place. I read a comment that you made. Each time one of the Von Eriks would come back to the dressing room, they'd have the Dallas, uh, Dallas Yellow Pages stuff down their trunks. <laughs> every, every, phone, every, every, every phone number in Dallas was stuck down their trunk, right? <laughs> you, you ain't lying. And uh, yeah, the Von Ericks, that they did that. I didn't. <laughs> you didn't. <laughs> yeah. You you had to be very careful there in in seriousness <clears throat> of what did get stuffed down in your trunks. You couldn't just take your trunks off in the dressing room. You had to <laughs> hunt, hunt and get the stuff yeah, out. Of it. <laughs> if the pop was walking through the dressing room at that time, he would have taken you to jail. So you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> yeah. I mean, oh my gosh, the 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 parties were rampant in Texas. Oh, <laughs> they were rampant in the auditorium. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm, I'm surprised. I'm surprised with all the drunk cowboys that there wasn't more violence in that building than you know what what we'd heard about. You know, there's really really wasn't much violence. No, it was all the other way of the baby faces trying to get up and down the aisle. Uh, to and from the ring you know we had good security but every once in a while something would happen but hardly ever yeah i never thought about it that way but that's all right yeah they but the drunk, drunk 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 cowboys and drunk texans there holy cow you know the heat that mm -hmm. you know you you had to be very careful on the heat you got with one of those water boys probably yeah but, but now <laughs> No, nothing like Puerto Rico. I don't know. Nothing like Puerto Rico, yeah. No, no nothing like nothing. Yeah. Not even close to being. And our heels had good heat because you don't right. sell out the sport. You don't sell out without a good heel heat. Yeah, they had good heat. But I don't remember Gary or Cactus, Mick Foley, having trouble with fans. I know they cut Foley's tires one time. <laughs> yeah, but First angle we did, they flattened all four of his tires. He come to me crying. <laughs> what do you want me to do? I said, hell, you got heat, brother. You got heat. <laughs> I was happy he got over. <laughs> but Gary, Gary, Gary Young had told me he had already uh, got him taken care of on his tires. So, But Foley always held that against me. <laughs> <laughs> so, so uh, Eric, Eric, what are they? Are you? You retired again. I know you're always an entrepreneur. You opened up several just during this conversation. You mentioned you'd open up several businesses there. I, I always heard that about you and always saw that. And that, that's one thing I always admire the guys in our business of doing and kind of stepping out of their comfort zone and opening up uh, other businesses. You're a very successful entrepreneur, too. Well, I did okay. Uh, if you can survive in the professional wrestling business, you can survive in any business. And I really mean that because you, you learn so much in the wrestling business. And uh, now I'm uh, into the 21st, 21st, 22nd year of a Dish Network kind of like franchise. Uh, I, I subcontract with a company, High Power Technical Services out of Louisville, who is a regional provider for Dish uh in Kentucky, Indiana, and Ohio, they've got 12, 14 offices. And uh, back before, uh, I, I used to keep eight, 10 techs working out of my office. And uh, then I had the heart attack, did the quadruple bypass, and stress was getting me. And so anyway, long story, high power hired my people. And I just kind of work when I checkbook cries or work when I want to. I like going to different people's houses and uh, fixing their TV or putting in their TV and so forth. But uh, High Power has been a, a lifesaver to me. They've been great to me and I've been great to them, kind of like my Dallas run. Dallas was good to me. I was good for Dallas. Uh, I'm in another one with uh, Dish Network now. Right. Eric, you, you had such a good run in Dallas, and you, you had the, the car wreck later that uh, you know kind of, it, I guess, did end your career. But 
did, did you ever did not want to go somewhere else? I mean, you had such success as a booker. Did you not want to go to WCW, ECW, WWE, Japan? Did you not want to continue doing that? Uh, you know, I thought about it, but uh, truth be told, I had to wreck Torp <clears throat> About a year later, I... Eric, Eric, I'm going to jump in here. A lot of people don't know. I kind of describe that wreck and how that happened, and, and you're you're going through some changes in life there, and you said that was the light that said, you know, I need to get out of this wrestling business. <laughs> you're right. <clears throat> it uh, had, had uh, gone through a divorce, and uh, like like a lot of wrestlers do. <laughs> but uh, anyway, uh, I was back up in Kentucky, and uh, Indian Lake Hills, a hill would go up as a curve at the top. And uh, I'm going up it in a little car, and a semi comes around the curve, jackknifed. I pull over to the guardrail. You the see that? You see the truck's already jackknifed. I, I can. Yeah, he comes around the curve, jackknifed. It's been rainy. Comes around the curve, jackknifed. I pull over to the car, put my car up against the guardrail. No place to go now. And I just I brace my legs. I grab the steering wheel. And I said, please, God, don't let it be too bad, because I knew I was fixing to get screwed. And boom. And uh, both knees were up into the dash. One was really screwed. And uh, I got uh, the seats were laid back. I got out the back door. The semi driver opened his door. And uh, he said, buddy, I, I got help on the way. And uh, I said, for what? He said, don't you need an ambulance? I said, if you get out of that truck, you're going to need one, pal. And he wouldn't get out of the <laughs> And uh, they'd actually had another wreck at the top of the hill, so it didn't take just a jippy for the cop and an ambulance to come on down to my wreck. And uh, like I say, I tried to uh, – I could have come back into the business. Uh, I worked a couple shows and uh, worked one show in Dallas. I don't remember for who. And uh, – but then I decided, you know, I would uh, got remarried. Uh, I could have got back in after a year or so. And I got remarried. We had a little girl. And uh, I had a little boy, or a big boy now, but uh, with the first wife. And uh, I always feel guilty because, and Jerry, you all, both of you know, uh, you're never home. Uh, I, I missed his childhood. Uh, he traveled with me a whole lot during the summers when he was out of school. And uh, it was like, you know, now I've got the daughter and it's like, you know, daddy needs to be home. And I always, always promised myself I wouldn't be like some of the old timers that I got such good advice from, but I wouldn't be like them and still be in the business when I couldn't perform like I used to. And to me, it was embarrassing to these guys that had to still go out and uh, wrestle because it's the only thing they knew, the only thing that, that was their only income and they hadn't saved any money. And now they can have walking with a cane and then still go try to wrestle. And I just said, there's no way I'll ever let that happen. And then it just, you know, that wreck was a message. It's time to go. And I took all my stuff to behind the barn out here where I live now and had the big old bonfire and burned up in my boots my robes everything to where i knew if i got the itch it would cost me a lot to get all the gear and stuff back and i also did not talk to anybody that had any connection one of the boys promoters anybody that had anything to do with wrestling for seven years is how long it took me to break the hold seven years and then i called Percy and said, hey, I'm still alive. Where are you been? And, you know, I started making contacts then. But it took me seven years to, to get it to break the hold. Wow. Kind of like, you know, Austin said it took him four or five. I wish I could have yeah. did it four. Yeah. <laughs> it, took it, 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 took, it took me at least two years for me to just get over it. You know, totally get over yep. it. My, my son laughs at me now. He said, Dad, uh, I can't believe you because we'll talk to him. He'll start talking about us. Man, I don't know anything. He said, I can't believe that you completely left the business because I was 24-7, just like a lot of us are in the business. And you miss, you miss so much. But uh, 
it takes it takes you a while. I mean, it's like being with somebody for forty years, and all of a sudden you're gone, man. What are you going to do? You know, but uh, you right. figure it out. You figure it out. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's a different life. It's a different lifestyle. There's there's a real lifestyle out there, and it's pretty cool. It took those old old timers used to talk about the real life. I remember we used to pass by pass by a house, and he'd look, hey, Briscoe, you think that guy up there on the hill matters? What what? How many tickets we sell tonight? He said he don't care. He don't he care. Said, That's where you need to be. <laughs> Going down the road, see the kids out playing basketball, out playing kickball in the yards, and kids on swings. And here we are making the town. Making the yeah. town, yeah. But we did so, it. It was a good. It was a we, good run. Good ride. Yeah, yeah, it, was, it was a great time. I wouldn't trade it for anything. Eric, yeah. you know, I ran into you in Philly a, a few weeks back, uh, you know, doing, yeah, a, doing an autograph right. thing. Yeah, great. Where, <laughs> where, 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 where can folks get a hold of you if you're, if you're interested mm -hmm. in doing these things? Where can, where can they book Eric Kim right now? All right, okay. I'll, give, I'll give you an email address, and it's just my name, Eric Embry, then at, then then all letters, B-B-T-E-L.com. Eric Embry at bbtel.com. And if any, you know, any people have any questions or remember some cool stuff we did in Florida or somewhere, you know, hey, email me. I, I like uh, playing on emails. Uh, sometimes I get too many. It takes me a day or two to get back with them, but uh, I, I still enjoy doing that part. Good. You know, when you've been gone long enough from the business, uh, you start to enjoy it more. You know, you we're new, right when you first get <laughs> right when you first get done, you know, like you say, you had that time where people say, "I hey, remember and so and so." You're like, I, I don't care. Now it's yep. uh, if, if Jerry tells me, "You remember and so I go, Yeah, I remember. And and now it's fun to yep. sit and talk about and reminisce. Mm -hmm. and, you know, just be one yep. of the old guys. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's pretty cool. Life, I, I'm blessed. You know, I mean, I'm blessed. But, I don't know. So many of our buddies are gone and uh, I don't understand why he still has me here, but he does. And, uh, you know, as long as they let me ride the boat, yeah. I'm just going to ride. It. Before we leave, you know, you brought up a name there that John and I both both adore the man and, and love the man. Uh, Percy Pringle, better known as Paul Bear. Tell us, tell us, do you got any good stories about Percy or when he was? I can't tell him. <laughs> yeah, you can. <laughs> oh, okay. I, I love Percy. Percy played a tremendous part of me getting over in Dallas. Uh, and his two, his boys were just little then. And Diane, she was, his wife was so sweet. Uh Percy would do any and everything I needed him to do, plus so much more. Uh, he, he was, he was, was a good sounding block for you, too. You could bounce stuff off of, and he's sharper, sharper in the business, too. More sharp yeah. than a lot of people give him credit for. Percy, yeah. Percy is very, very bright in this business. The, uh, I can remember that one, one thing I do remember that, uh, bothers me to this day sometimes is we were driving down the road and I was driving for whatever reason because Percy always drove and uh, go in Louisiana long straight stretch I'm driving and he says I am buy it one look at this and he hands over a bunch of pictures in front of me as I'm driving I said what and I go looking and brother it's people on the embalming table <laughs> legitimate people legitimate people being in bomb that he had took when he worked at the funeral home in mobile or whatever for whatever i was like, oh my i don't know what whole, uh, funeral home that was i shouldn't say mobile it could have been 10 other ones but because it probably wasn't the thing to do to have pictures of people <laughs> but um, i can still yeah, and I'll do it tonight because I brought it back into my mind. I'll shut my eyes and be seeing these different people. Old people, young people, babies. Oh, my God, it's horrible. I'll remember that. I'll take hey, that sight to my grave. When, uh, when Glenn Jacobs first came in as Kane in, in WWE, you know, he's big K fame. He'd, he'd wear a mask, you know, coming into the arenas. He wore a towel over his head. So he's driving one time, and Percy's in the passenger seat. And there's fans everywhere. Percy rolls down the window. He goes, Kane can drive. Kane can drive. <laughs> <laughs> it made Glenn so mad. 
He used to love, to try, to, he used to, love to try to do that to Glenn. Yes, that, that's was all. Yeah, personally, yeah, he, he was so much fun to be oh. around. You know, just anywhere, not just the business at the matches. He was just cool yeah. to be around. And if he liked you, he would take off his shirt and give it to you, shoes and socks, and walk through hell. He just, he was a good guy. Good guy. I miss Percy. Well, Eric, thank good. you so much for joining us. I've been looking forward to this, and it's <laughs> such a pleasure to finally meet you and to have you, have you on the show. Hey, I... <laughs> Pleasure is all mine. I hope I didn't let you guys down. I hope I entertained you for a few minutes and uh, guarantee it was all truth and no BS. And uh, if you ever want any more, just come and get some. Come and get some.